Thank you all for being here. I'm Tiffany Pewitt. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Diversity and Civic, Not Civic Life. And this webinar is The Great Replacement, Conspiracy, Fear, and Media. And um, I'm super excited that we have Dr. Carmen Celestini with us today. Uh, Dr. Celestini is an instructor in uh, religious studies at the University of Waterloo um, in Waterloo, Ontario. So she's coming to us from Canada. Uh, she's also a recent postdoctoral fellow with the Disinformation Project at Simon Fraser University. Her research has focused on the overlapping belief systems of Christian apocalyptic thought and conspiracy theories in North America. And today she's going to talk to us about her research on the Great Replacement Theory, how it connects to Texas, um, and also give us the sense too of the kind of uh, international transnational connection between um, the US and Canada as well. Um, we will do a question and answer period uh, at the end, and um, I'll ask that you put your questions in the comments and um, I'll, I will field those questions. Um, so if questions come up for you while she's talking, you can go ahead and um, put them in, uh, uh, not the comments, but the chat, and, um, and then we'll get to them at the end. And with that, I uh, will turn this over to, um, Dr. Celestini. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, I, I'm going to do a sharing of my screen, which I understood when we were doing this, it was a little lagged. So I will hopefully see it. You can now see my application, yes? <clears throat> All right, so today we're gonna talk about conspiracy theories and focusing predominantly on the great replacement conspiracy theory and the role of fear and media in this conversation. So to open up, I'm going to give a little bit of a primer on conspiracy theories. This can be a rather large topic. So this is a very uh, small summary of what conspiracy theories are and how they take hold. So conspiracy theories uh, genuinely become a part of a person's belief system when they're provoked by fear and fear and this perpetual sense of disaster. So if we think about the idea of us, what we just went through in COVID, um, I know in Texas, you weren't as locked down as long as we were. In Toronto, we were locked down for a full two years. Just this Saturday, we could stop and remove our masks. So our lives were in our homes and only on social media. And what happens is that you have this sense of perpetual fear, fear of the virus, fear of losing your job, fear of losing your home, fear of vaccines potentially, and the outcome of what is going on. So when it's this perpetual sense of fear, sometimes you can turn to your religious leaders for or religious thought for hope, but when that doesn't provide the answers, we turn to human-made reasons for why it's happening. So we think these disasters are actually being created by a small cabal or some group or some type of scapegoat. Under every conspiracy theory is an articulation of injustice. That injustice may be real or it may be just perceived. For a conspiracy theory to take hold, there has to be a sense of distrust in the institutions of society. So we have distrust in our legacy media, distrust in our government institutions, distrust in all of the institutions of society worldwide. And we feel that there's no transparency, nor do they represent who we are. And we feel that we're powerless to affect our government and they're not articulating our worldviews. So when we think about conspiracies at this juncture, we think about QAnon. It's one of the first things that pop into all of our minds. And so QAnon is a very unique conspiracy because it's what we call a super conspiracy. So we have the QAnon idea at the top, but other conspiracy theories are nested within that. And so we could have conspiracy theories like the Great Replacement or the Great Reset, and they're linked together, but they're hierarchical. So one is more important than the other and some are less important. What can happen with some conspiracy theories is that people believe that there's a paranoia for society as a whole, not towards the individual, but towards the nation, so towards America, and that they're the keepers of the truth. 
and they become what we call social heroes. And social heroes believe that they can save the nation or save the world if they come together. And they know that they will be denigrated, that they will be ostracized for their ideas of what the truth is and what they believe. So if we think about you know, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, when Hillary Clinton referred to his supporters as a basket full of deplorables, they took on that moniker because it was validation for who they were and that they were fighting against this cabal or this idea of power within the government. Sometimes that social heroism can lead people to acts of violence. So if we think about what happened with Pizzagate, the person who went to the pizza place in Washington, D.C. with a gun, believing that he could save children that were being trafficked from the basement. And when he got to Ping Pong Pizza, there wasn't a basement, nor there were children, but he ended up being arrested for that. But he truly felt that he would get the hero's welcome for what he did. So focusing in on the great replacement conspiracy theory itself, this term and this theory was developed by an author named Renaud Hamas, and his book, The Great Replacement, was written in 2011. And this is um, Renaud here in this image. Now, he is um, a French author. He, is, um, he was very well known for writing homoerotic um, novels. And he was quite well known and quite famous for it. But he started changing his mind and his ideas about society. For the longest time, um, he was a socialist. And he had postgraduate degrees. He was a very well-educated person. And then at the age of 46, he had what he calls an epiphany. And this led to his development of the Great Replacement. The epiphany was that he was traveling around writing tour novels about the country of France. And he went to some of the really old villages and he realized that the demographics of those old villages had changed. And that changed his perspective and made him think that, that white people were slowly being replaced from France and that it was becoming predominantly immigrants. So in 2002, he actually started his own racist um, political party. It was a populist party and but he didn't officially launch it until 2012 during the French presidential election of that year. His party, party platform advocated a notion of re-immigration. So sending immigrants and their family members back to their country of origin. And then eventually end all immigration to the country of France. Since 2011, he's been spreading this warning about this idea of a great replacement across France and across Europe. In 2017, he co-founded an organization called the National Council of Resistance, which was a pan-European movement to oppose what he called the great replacement. He wanted, the group wanted to end immigration to Europe and it wanted to defeat what it calls replacist totalitarianism. He predicted that in 2022, the French presidential election was far too late for France to be saved from this totalitarian immigration. And he felt that the immigrants of France would become the masters of the elections and that there could no longer be a political solution to this problem in his country. So really what he was articulating was a fear. He was a, the fear of losing his nationalism, the fear of what was happening within his country, that he wasn't seeing himself within his nation consistently. And so this was a perceived injustice to him. And the articulation was through attacking immigration. One of the resolutions that many of these sort of fear movements has is populism. So if we think about political leaders, they will use these type of topics and say that, yes, it is a true injustice. And through my policies, once you elect me, I can provide the resolution to this problem. And the populist leaders become a voice for that silent majority in the country. So you're like, okay, so we have this book, what's the big deal? The so what about this is that there is a link to America. So if we think about the Unite the Right rally that happened in Charlottesville, Virginia, 
um, we saw the white nationalists walking through carrying tiki torches, yelling, you will not replace us. And some were yelling, Jews will not replace us. The phrase, you will not replace us, is actually the credo of um, Candace's book. And it is a constant line and a trope throughout the entire book. When this happened after the Unite the Right rally, media in America contacted Camus and asked him what he thought about what happened in Charlottesville. And his response was that he didn't support the actual violence and the connects to Nazism that were apparent at the rally, but he said that he could understand the anger that the white nationalists were articulating at that, pro at that protest. And he approved of that sentiment. So now we have a book that is being foundational to this movement and the author himself saying, you are valid in what you're doing and what you're saying. <laughs> From that um, protest, the Unite the Right Valley, Camus actually wrote his first book in English and he titled it, You Will Not Replace Us. So now we have sort of a back and forth between the start and what has evolved in America. Now, this is not an American issue. There is also the great replacement concept here in Canada as well. And so one of our nationalists, um, Lauren Southern, who is quite well known in the right wing in America, posted a YouTube video called The Great Replacement, where she articulated this theory. At this point, it's had over half a million viewers. And it was also one of the conduits to the theory's uh, popularization in America. In Chemist's book, he argues that industrialization, despiritualization or secularization or loss of religion and deculturalization have created a foundation where immigration is required for capitalism to continue. And that our materialistic globalized world that we live in demands that we bring in extra workers and extra people to accommodate our demands for materialist needs. He focuses on an idea that there's a lack of God in Western society. And this has, in his mind, led for an opportunity for white people to be replaced. One of the important parts of this book is that he cites a book called The Camp of Saints, which was re written by Jean Raspiel in 1973 as being one of his inspirations. So I'm going to focus a little bit here on The Camp of Saints because it has had a significant impact on the country of America. Um, in The Camp of Saints, um, Jean Raspiel actually talks about um, the idea of hordes of immigrants traveling in convoys to Europe. And they're traveling by sea and by land, and their eventual goal is to take over and destroy Western civilization in Europe. In the book, he paints a narrative where Christian religious leaders are competing against each other to encourage immigration into Europe. And he puts this idea that the religious uh, leaders, predominantly Christian ones, are trying to um, position themselves as heroes for welcoming people into the um, country or into the continent. Now, throughout the book, he also provides images of the sexual desecration of prominent Catholic priests. And he's sort of using this as an analogy for the destruction of religion by, by immigrants. Now, throughout the book, there is a trope that immigrants um, do not care about their children and that um, there is a, sex, a sense of sexual immorality that's attached to the community. And he also strikes these images where he says that immigrants, especially women and children, will pose at the border in positions that will get the most sympathy when mainstream media take their pictures. And that sympathy that comes from us seeing those images welcome the immigrants and that actually the media on the left is, is encouraging us to welcome these hordes that are going to come in and take over our culture. Now his book too was inspired by something that he saw and he was at one of his family's homes and um, he was looking out across the water and that he saw and he thought to himself, what if they came? At that point in time, he didn't really know who they were 
But then he spent an entire year writing this book. He said that he was so inspired that it was almost like automatic writing. And he just wrote the book fanatically. And when the book came out in 1973, it was not well received. But then it came out in the United States in 1975. And as the topic of immigration rose in Europe and in America, the book sales started increasing exponentially. The title of the book comes from the Bible in the book of Revelations. And to add an additional level of religion to it, the hordes arriving in, in Europe arrive over Easter weekend. And he quotes it as being three days for the end of the white world. Now, there are important tropes in this book that we should consider. So throughout the book, he talks about the media and he develops an idea of distrust in left-wing media. And he really positions it between the left and the right in media. So this division that we see in society now, um, he says that the news itself on the left has become more as a sermon than it actually does about presenting the facts about what is happening. In the book, the way that the right-wing media um, decries what is happening with these convoys that are coming across into Europe, they say that they have to save the race and save the country and at whatever price, inhuman or not, and that they need to come back from where they came from or sink to the bottom or put them into camps. And so this is an important trope when we think about what has happened. So what is the connection to America? Both Steve Bannon and Steve Miller both cited this book as being influential to their understanding of immigration policies. The Pope in the novel is from Brazil, and he has this message that um, he has a plea that we need to open our doors and to let people in, even if it's from the Pope. The, it's, he is the feeble voice of the sick Christian world. So this connection, um, Stephen Miller actually wrote to one of the editors of Breitbart before Trump was elected. And he asked her to write an article about the Camp of Saints. Now that did not go through right away, but slowly, 18 days later, an article came out called the Camp of Saints Scene mirrored in the Pope's message. So now we have a Pope who is from Central America, who is talking about immigration, who's talking about caring. And the response from Stephen Miller is to sort of build up this idea that the Pope is actually supporting this idea of the takeover of America through immigration. In 2014, Bannon spoke at a conference at the, Va at the Vatican and his message to the Vatican um, and predominantly conservative um, bishops and cardinals was that Judeo-Christian West in North America was in a crisis state because of immigration. He linked it to the same ideas that were attached to the Camp of Saints and to um, Camus's book, The Great Replacement. He said that it was links to capitalism that brought immigration to America. And he said that because of this capitalism, people have become commodities. And unfortunately, in his opinion, that secularization and the taking of God out of, out of the classroom and out of society was one of the ways that this great replacement was happening, that we didn't have someone to turn to who was our deity and our God to give us the rules and understanding. He also articulated all of this as a war against Islamic fascism. So it was a war between religions, and it was also a very xenophobic trope that he was bringing out. Now, both Stephen Miller and Steve Bannon have said that this book is foundational to their ideas and books that they have recommended to the media and to people who support them. Now, <clears throat> this dystopian idea that was created in the fictional book, The Camp of Saints, ended up being articulated with Bannon speaking to the Vatican against immigration and against helping um, those who are in social, lower social economic um, tiers. And also there was the notion of caravans coming up from South America into America. 
And the idea of them being hordes, the idea of them actually being, you know, criminals and trying to come and destroy and attack the country. Steve Bannon and Steve Miller also articulated the ideas that the U.S. churches were promoting an idea of immigration lawlessness by providing sanctuary and by providing support. There is also an articulation that they blamed legacy media or mainstream media about the images that were coming through and that the ideas about the caravans that they were articulating were untrue. And in one case, they actually articulated that the immigrants that were coming up in the caravans were posing in positions that actually would garner the most sympathy from left-wing media. So we'd see a very similar trope that the ideas that were in this book were being articulated in real life in the politics of America. So the Great Replacement itself, now we know its roots, is an idea or a conspiracy theory that white people are being replaced by immigration and also by low birth rates by white women. This idea is propagated through conspiracy theories predominantly online. And we can see that these conspiracy theories, it's not a standalone thing. We can see that it appears in COVID-19 conspiracy theories about the vaccine itself being a form of population control. A lot of right-wing and white nationalist organizations, and when I say right-wing, I mean extremists, um, articulate their ideas and their ideologies not you know, out in the open. So what they'll actually use is memes. And in these memes, they will focus on the idea of immigration. So what we see here in Canada and what we see in, in the United States as well is this idea is that if immigrants come in, they will vote for the other party and take over and we will never win. There will never be any opposition. So it's not necessarily always an idea of cultural takeover, but also political power. There are a lot of memes that come out from populist leaders. Um, here in Canada, we have um, Maxime Bernier, who's running for the People's Party of Canada. And their entire platform was based upon conspiracy theories about population control, about tyranny, about the Great Reset, the Great Replacement. And they did that through memes, particularly about immigration control. So what we see with these populist leaders, as I said earlier, is that they will articulate these ideas. Now, it won't be um, you know, in your face, but it will be very subtle and it will sort of be dog whistles to these ideas. Yeah. Pundits <clears throat> on newscasts or on, I'm gonna use quotes here, on news for, um, on BitChute or on YouTube, people who articulate their worldview and what's happening um, in society with contemporary events will link these to these ideas of these conspiracy theories of population control of white people and white women um, not um, giving birth to the same rates as other nationalities. And they'll talk consistently about how immigration is hurting a country culturally and politically. What the Great Replacement does, it defines who a nation is. It defines them by their ethnicity, by their culture, and by their history. It also defines who is and who is not an American. Now, I know that in the news, there has been a lot of conversation about um, different pundits and uh, news anchors talking about the Great Replacement Theory. But I want to put this into context that in 2006, Lou Dobbs on his newscast said that Mexicans were coming into America across the border to reclaim their land um, from Mexico that it used to be historically Mexican. So he created this narrative that a piece of America was going to be taken away and reclaimed. There is this idea that Christianity or Judeo-Christian um, beliefs are a definition of who the nation is. With that comes this idea of white culture, and they position themselves as victims, that Christianity is being attacked, that it's an attack on their religious freedom. So they put themselves in this position that they're being persecuted and a victim to what is occurring. But they also turn religion around to be a weapon, that if we come together as Christians or Judeo-Christian believers, we can battle against whatever the scapegoat horde may be or whatever the immigration problems may be. 
there is a focus on feminism and LGBTQ2SA communities. In the articulation of the Great Replacement, there is notions of uh, the emasculation of men and that you know, they need to be our warriors to protect the nation. There's an attack on feminism because women are understood as being the people who pass on the cultural traditions, who pass on religion to the nation and to their families. Women are also responsible for the reproduction of the next generation and the next generation. So we need to be protected in some way, but they fight against feminism and they fight against LGBTQ because it's at odds with the nation or the idea that they're defining through the great replacement. So there has been violence that is attacked, uh, that is attached to the great replacement conspiracy theory. The Christchurch mosque shootings in March, 2019, where Brenton Tarrant shot um, and killed 51 people at two mosques and injured 40 people. In his manifesto, he cited the great replacement conspiracy theory and that he needed to stop this replacement of whites or the white genocide as he understood it through immigration. In 2019, the great replacement also affected a shooting in Texas. In El Paso, um, Patrick Crius um, shot in Allen, Texas um, at a Walmart store. He killed 23 people and injured 23 more. It was dubbed the deadliest attack on Latinos in modern American history. In his manifesto that he posted on 8, 8chan, he said he cited Tarrant, the shooter from Christchurch, and he also articulated his fears of the Great Replacement and how um, Americans, uh, white Americans, were being replaced by immigration. Most recently, we saw it in the 2022 attack in Buffalo, New York, with Peyton Gendron. He shot 10, it killed 10 people at Topps Friendly Market and injured three more. All of his victims were predominantly um, African Americans. In his manifesto, he actually copied and pasted pieces from Terence, the Christchurch Attacks um, Manifesto into his own. He articulated numerous times about the Great Replacement and how he needed to kill the African-Americans who were there because it was his move, hopefully, to get more people to follow his lead and do the same to save white America. Now, Jen Young's manifesto is much more dangerous than others as his Discord diary and his manifesto went through step by step, all of the things that he bought, all of the things that he tested. And it's really almost a handbook on how to accomplish this, which is why we haven't seen much of the manifesto out there because it is truly a handbook. Now, one of the things that he did, much like the Christ shooter, was he also live streamed what he was doing in the shooting when he was at the Topps Friendly Market. Now, there have been other shootings that have occurred, um, mass shootings, from the Great Replacement, but I wanted to just focus on these three that we would all recognize. Now, the Great Replacement conspiracy theory also is foundational to a group of white nationalists who call themselves identitarians. It is their strand of white nationalism, and it started in France, where, too, the Great Replacement book began. And their ideas about nationalism and white replacement and saving whites and their culture, whatever country they may come from, has spread around the globe. And in fact, here in Canada, two days ago, there was an abacus poll that came out and 40% of Canadians believe in conspiracy theories and over 30% believe in this notion of the great replacement. So this isn't something that is inherently an American problem. It is a worldwide conspiracy theory that is having ramifications. Now, in America, there are specific white nationalist groups. Identity of Ropa has spread to America, and they ID themselves as being the American identity movement. And I'll show, oh, there's this funny mistake. Richard Spencer's um, think tank, the National Policy Institute, also articulates the great replacement conspiracy theory as part of its rationale. In Canada, we have ID Canada and we have Le, La Muerte, which is, a, which is a, now a terrorist group here in Canada. But during our freedom convoys, which I'm sure most of you have heard about when our nation was taken over, our nation's capital and our borders, um, 
th these identitarian groups actually created a separate convoy and a separate camp just outside of Ottawa, where they could interact with the convoy, convoy supporters. Now, I am going to focus on Texas here for a little bit, but please know that it's not just Texas. Now, what you'll see for the next few slides could be offensive, so I will say there is a trigger warning to this. But each one of these images that we are about to see come from a White Lives Matter group on Telegram, which is a social media platform. It is a specific um, chapter of White Lives Matters, which is a response movement to Black Lives Matters, where they believe that people of color are actually not only trying to replace white Americans, but also are harming and creating a white genocide in America. So we can see here in this one message post here from Telegram that they believe that because they have low birth rates, we need to start increasing our birth rates. So we see this idea of women playing a role in this. And so they talk about the fact that the people are coming here or coming to America, sorry, um, and that they're not listening to their own ancestors and to their own heritage. And they're not articulating this idea that they're being replaced. And they're talking about what happens when you react to this. And so in direct reaction to the BLM protests, they're saying that if you protest as a White Lives Matter person, you're instantaneously put in jail for hate speech. And so they're articulating their feeling of being silenced. And so they're saying that diversity is not the greatest strength of America and is actually harmful to America. Here we see a direct message in um, White Lives Matter is Texas saying that it's time for them to tribe up as a group white males and learn how to train to combat and battle in America. White Lives Matter holds um, protests across North America. Where I am right now in Toronto, we are the only location in Canada, but we use the exact same dates as well. So these are all the dates that they have planned for protests in 2022. And they say that there are, there are the 12 days that must be articulated as being the last battle to save white America. And so they believe that their women are being raped and attacked and that children are being killed. Here we see someone who is saying that they cannot get um, COVID care at one of the hospitals in Texas because they are white and that they do not meet the criteria to be able to get the care that they need. There's also this articulation that, although scholars like myself that say that this is a conspiracy, they work very, very hard to articulate through what is happening politically in your country to talk about how it is true. So you will actually hear some conspiracy theorists this day, these days say, well, what we were calling a conspiracy theory three months ago is now a fact. And so they will actually use occurrences that are happening to justify their belief systems and for them to battle back. Here, we actually saw a video where they were using Schumer's words about immigration and about how you know, we had to think about the borders and how we had to think about who was coming into the country. And they said that they were doing this simply so that the Democrats would get votes. Now, where there is a lot of pleas in this White Lives Matters Texas group that people need to come together and that they need to fight against globalist diversity. So in this idea, it's not just America that has this problem. They understand that it is a worldwide issue and their ideas and that they need to come together as a group and that white people must join together to battle this and that they must spread this message so that way they can build a continuous and strong front. So one of the things that I will leave this with is that it's not just about violence. It's also about politics. And what they follow is something that is called metapolitics, which is an idea that you need to strike change from within. So it's a term that employs infiltration of political parties, infiltration of public administration, universities, and media and use that opportunity of infiltration to um, change cultural power and policymaking to save America and not to keep it as politics as usual. 
So what this means to them is that they need to engage in all levels of politics and articulate this battle against diversity through school boards, TPAs, library boards, and through municipal politics, eventually leading to the point that they can get higher up in political parties. There are connections to um, traditional political parties, but also independent parties as well. So this, in the end, is not simply a political movement. It is also an ideology to change the understanding of society. So it is a conspiracy theory that doesn't have validation and really articulates fear of loss of power, but it can affect not just through politics, but also through violence. But we have to understand the role of populism. Populism is affecting countries across the globe and the foundation of many of their policy platforms are conspiracy theories such as the Great Replacement. And so I'll leave that there and stop sharing. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much for sharing that, Carmen. That um, was a lot of good information. It's a lot to take in. <laughs> so thank you for sharing all of that. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions that you'd like to ask um, of Carmen? Uh, you can put those in the chat. Well, I have a question while maybe others are okay. thinking about their questions, but um, you know, one thing that came up for me that, that I was thinking about um, was uh, the connection between the great replacement theory and uh, Christian nationalism. And it, and it seems like the two are uh, very intertwined, but I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Absolutely. So we can see that there is a connection towards Christian nationalism because it is um, allowing Christianity to come back as the predominant religion and the governing religion in a country. And so we can see this movement is linked to it because white nationalists will actually play upon this idea and saying that secularization and the taking of God out of society has created the problems that we're understanding. So if we think about immigration, you know, the ideas, the way that they articulate it is, you know, they'll take your jobs. They'll, you know, they're changing education. They're, um, you know, putting your children at risk, putting other people at um, risk. And that it's also putting politics at risk. So in America, there is a trope that by opening up the borders and by having immigration, that they will, immigrants will predominantly vote for the Democratic Party. So the Republican Party itself will never have power again if this continues. In Canada, we have the same idea that, you know, the Liberal Party will continuously be in power if we continue to let immigration um, grow in Canada as well. So it's a use of fear. So especially now in COVID where people are, you know, struggling for positions and to get back financially from what's happened and inflation, you know, we see that our money is worth less. And so we need to find a scapegoat and an understanding for that to help ourselves. And so they can play on these motions and religions, some religions and some churches will actually articulate that as a defining moment of who our nation is and how it's changing because of other um, religions coming in and becoming predominant. Thank you. And I see, um... We have a couple of questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, so Mary asked uh, if you could speak to what the FBI is doing about surveillance um, of these groups. And then, uh, and then an also kind of related question is how um, the proliferation of firearms in the US might be connected uh, with this movement. Um, well, the FBI absolutely is um, watching over these groups. Um, the Department of Homeland Security has declared that these types of groups are a domestic form of domestic terrorism in America. I know that America and Canada, our, um, our CSIS works closely where we talk about these things. So, and they're, they're watching it. There's a lot of monitoring of um, social media platforms of what they're articulating and what they're planning. So one white nationalist group last week, um, Patriot Front, 
um, had posted a video of them training and saying, you know, what day they were going to do something. Then we saw what happened where they were going to the pride event. Now that wasn't connected, but right before that, there was a warning that there could be escalated attacks on pride events, given the groomer moral panic that's happening in America right now. Um, with the Proud Boys, after January 6th, my country designated them a terrorist group. The Proud Boys started here in Canada, actually, um, with Gavin McGuinness, he's a Canadian, and um, Incel Social started here as well. And so these movements, they work together and the FBI does monitor um, media, social media, and pay attention to any heightened viruses or viral things that are happening online. Um, as for the guns, I feel that um, really, it, I would only be able to give my personal opinion on this. Um, I'm not an, ex an expert in all of the laws and rules around guns in America, but I do think that um, they are armed. Um, these groups do see this as a battle and a fight for America. In some ways, they can become very um, militant and militaristic. Now, one of the things that these white nationalist groups do do is they, um, they work to recruit um, veterans and people who are past um, law enforcement officers simply because they do know and have that tactical experience on how to um, do a violent event, how to protect, how to use weapons, how to do those kind of things. And so I know both America and Canada have been working with the armed forces as a whole to learn how to deal with hate policy, how to deal with recruitment, and how to um, deal with people who may get involved with extremism and how to, in, for lack of a better word, deprogram them to stay out of those situations. So there are active movements happening. I do know that the Department of Homeland Security also has endless grants for people who study these type of things as well. Thank you. We also have questions uh, from Bud and from Sadia. They, they both overlap in which, um, but ask if you can say more about um, constructive counter efforts or best practices. Uh, Sadia asked something similar. Um, what is the solution? Um, are there any things that can be done? And, uh, but Bud also asked, where is there hope? Oh, there's definitely hope. Um, I know I teach a lot of negative topics, so I always try to find the good in everything that we do. Um, I think that, you know, worldwide, we're starting to understand the impact of disinformation and the impact of conspiracy theories. Now, conspiracy theories obviously are not something new. They've been um, around forever, but we have seen for decades upon decades, building of distrust of institutions and of legacy media. So what we need to do is an actual globalized response to disinformation and to conspiracy theories. If America does something on its own, it is not going to change the impact because on the internet, there are no borders. So I will give you an example that, you know, is an articulation that I use all the time. When we were having our freedom convoys, one of the leaders was arrested and at her bail hearing, her husband said that the judge was affecting his First Amendment rights. Canada does not have First Amendment rights. We do have free speech, but that is not an amendment of our constitution. And so their understanding of the rights was global. It was American, it wasn't Canadian. And so there are no borders when we understand these ideas. So if one country makes a movement, that's not going to change the overall boundarylessness of the internet. So we need to come together. And I think governments are actually doing that. We can see them talking about different ploys and ideas to deal with disinformation and, you know, deal with the very delicate ideas of your First Amendment or ideas of censorship. We also need to learn how to have conversations again. So we see this divide politically around the world against first right versus left. And, you know, we talk about the things that we want to fight about and what we believe in and not believe in, but we stop talking to each other as humans. And so one of the things that I continuously articulate, articulate about conspiracy theories is that it's an, an articulation of injustice, real or perceived, and it is an answer to fear. So when we talk to each other, we need to come to that with, this is what I'm fearing, and this is what I'm feeling, and this is what I'm concerned about. And I want to talk to you about that and not your solutions, but just our emotions. It's almost like watching an episode of Intervention, right? We don't talk about 
the addiction, we talk about the person and connecting to them again. Now, solution wise, we really need to look at that and our governments need to articulate a way of transparency, but we also need to bring respect back to politics. Um, and, and I'm not just saying this about America, but Canada as well. We have um, political leaders who are more interested in placating bases and laying insults and attacking each other rather than talking about policies. And what happens is, is with these issues like the great replacement theory or other conspiracy theories is they start leading what the conversation is for political action. And so if there's a federal election, that is the conversation, not what is actually truly what needs to be talked about. And so they try to develop policies to talk about those or solve those issues that are not truly issues. But we do need to learn how to have a conversation as a government and as ind individuals. And I think when we do that, then we will see a difference. Thanks. Um, let's see. Uh, Bud ask about um, platforms. Uh, what are the platforms where you have to track and follow and how is that changing? And that it seems like many um, people aren't aware of the cringe level of this content because um, it's in the dark web and in um, coded ways. Yeah, and that's part of disinformation. So the social platforms that I deal with, I'm on Getter and Gab and Telegram and BitChute and Odyssey and all of the platforms, um, because that's what I do. And I'm a social media addict and it's not pleasant most days. But um, I do spend an inordinate amount of time on those websites. Now, it is not, I mean, the dark web is very different and it keeps changing constantly. Now, we can find some white nationalist white uh, websites that have been taken off. Um, mainstream web internet there, but predominantly we see it on most websites. I mean, even when we're talking about Elon Musk taking over Twitter and, you know, everyone was freaking out saying, oh my God, all the right wing people are going to come back and, you know, the white nationalists and the hate, but that never lasts. I follow white nationalists, Canadian white nationalists on Twitter openly. Um, they are there and they're talking about it. But what happens is we create a social bubble that echoes our beliefs and we don't acknowledge that those other things are there unless we encounter it. Now, your idea about it being um, trafficked in coded ways is absolutely right, but when we think about disinformation, disinformation ha might have a grain of truth to it. And so we share that because we think it's true. We don't always research what we should be researching before we share something. We're all on our phones doing this and pressing share. And if it comes from somebody that you trust, you share it. But they might have done the same thing you're doing. It's just sharing it. And we're spreading this disinformation. So really, it behooves all of us. And we are all responsible for taking the time to look and see if there are some valid proof for the things that are in the memes that we share. I mean, I, I'm going to give a Canadian context. So we see that it is a globalized problem. But in Canada, during our federal right now, there's a link that our prime minister is attached to the Great Reset. And there is a meme going around where there's a picture of him and our, um, our Secretary of State sort of version of yours and another individual. And it says death of a nation on it, like it's a movie poster. Now that harkens back to Birth of a Nation, which was the film that sparked the Ku Klux Klan. So somebody will see that and be like, oh yeah, it is the death of Canada and just share it. But they're actually sharing a white nationalist trope and idea and mockery of what is happening and a call to arms. So really we need to stop and think and memes are powerful tools. And we should also think about that if we're watching something on YouTube or BitChute that is articulating a very nefarious idea of someone else being in control rather than your president or your prime minister, Think about what is being said and actually go and look for other valid sources of that material. Um, we have another question here from Glenda. Uh, Glenda says that uh, she attended a talk by a demographer where he said that due to higher birth rates among Hispanic Texans, it was inevitable that white non-Hispanics were not going to hold on to their voting majority. Uh, is that true even without immigration, as he said? 
Um, that may not be something that you is kind of in your area of expertise. Yeah, I don't, it's the, really not. Sorry. Texas. Yeah. Um, I don't think I could answer that question, honestly. So, right. yeah. Um, I do, I, I do believe that I have heard that as well. Um, but just, you know, some of my response to this is that, uh, I think what's kind of interesting about that is, um, that, uh, um, Hispanic Texans are not monolithic and they're not like a singular voting group. And there are a lot of uh, cultural differences among them. And so I think, you know, sometimes we can hear this language that puts people together in a group and creates a sort of us versus them dynamic and doesn't really look at the nuances of those kinds of um, cultural and uh, differences amongst ethnic groups. Um, which is, you know, I, I don't think that that's exactly a conspiracy theory per se, but I think it can fuel those kinds of, um, conspiracy theories. Uh, oh, and another comment here from, uh, Habiba, um, I'd like to introduce the ideas of your talk to undergrads. I teach a first year course on social justice. Can you recommend a good text for that audience? That's a good question. Yeah, there is a great book by Michael Barkum. I'll actually type it, put his name in here. And I think it's called Conspiracy Theories of America, I think. But um, yeah, I, I look at Michael Barkum and uh, his book sort of goes through the history of conspiracy theories, specifically on America and how it has led to violence and how it's changed through the internet. So um, it's one of the texts that's foundational to, to my research, so. And one more question uh, from Sadia, who asked um, if you think that the anti-abortion movement is related to concerns about um, birth rates. I guess that would mean uh, decreasing um, birth rates amongst uh, um, the white demographic. I think that um, the abortion topic is um, anti-abortion movement definitely has different contingencies. It's not one, you know, cohesive group. So I think that there is very much a religious contingent that sees it in one way, but we do see white nationalists absolutely being um, pro-life. So the Patriot Front group that was just arrested going to the Pride event also has gone to pro-life events and been sort of like the muscle um, on the side and acting like bouncers and protecting the pro the pro life individuals because they believe that um, abortion is um, part of the problem that we're having with the great replacement because white women are choosing to have careers and this is their articulation and it is not you know real but white women are choosing to have careers and they're feminists and they're not making babies and if they do get pregnant then they have abortions and that is causing part of this problem that they're having with the white genocide and the um, the white replacement. So, you know, there's different prongs to this conversation, absolutely, but it does support white nationalism and the ideas of great replacement. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're coming close to the end of our time together. I think we could maybe squeeze in one more question. Um, let's see, our last question here from Bud. Uh, what do you make of the use of religious imagery in the January 6th insurrection and the Charlottesville uh, rally? Well, I've been talking about January 6th. Just so you know, Canada is all over the January 6th information that's happening right now. Um, we, When we think about the religious imagery at the January 6th um, rally, Donald Trump played a two-minute video. And um, in that video were so many religious and so many conspiracy theory tropes that were attached to that with ideas of, you know, Joe B President Biden being, um, you know, a hologram or not real or being dead. Um, the images of fighting for religion and that he is the hero for religion that will fight these ideas. You know, religion, um, religion language can be an extremely powerful tool for social movements for both good and bad social movements. Because if we think about religious language, if I said the word, um, you know, a religious word about freedom or, you know, um, 
we all have different understandings of that word. My understanding of it would be different as a Canadian compared to an agrarian Peruvian farmer or compared to someone who's a Texan. All of us can understand words in a different way. And religious language is something that we all can recognize and we all understand it. And it can motivate us to who our values are, what our morals are, and what we believe in and what we will fight for, no matter how or what lens we look at it through. So by using tropes of religion um, attached to nationalism and, you know, with the, the Charlottesville rally, it was important because they were fighting for the statues and for the history of America. And that articulation for white nationalists is a Christian America. So that's why we see those images being held up and why they're being articulated for these movements. Well, thanks so much, Carmen. We're at our time now. This was uh, really such a wonderful talk and really informative. And um, I imagine that many of us will be continuing to uh, kind of chew on many of these ideas for a while to come because it's definitely um, really complex. And uh, I think you've done an excellent job too of helping us see really the complexity of these issues and that um, our response to this is something that's going to have to develop over time and be multifaceted. And um, it's not gonna be so simple to, uh, to figure out, but it's really great to have this background to help us better understand what's happening um, around us right now. So thank you again thank you so for your much. time and for your expertise. And thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. Well, um, as I mentioned, we've recorded this and we will um, post this on our YouTube channel and I'll share it on social media um, so that you'll have access to, to this um, in case you wanna watch again or um, share with other folks you know who weren't able to join us today. So thank you all and have a wonderful evening.